I am, I'm Vern, and I'm the vegetable and berry specialist with EVM Extension for 25 years now, hard to believe, but basically I work with farmers. I like to say I'm co-learning. I, I think over the years it's evolved for me from being a technical expert, which was sort of always uncomfortable because farmers are so smart, they know so much, and they have so many different areas of interest and questions, to more of an information facilitator that I sometimes say it's like I hold mirrors up to the community and help them see each other and talk to each other. And that's just gotten really cool in recent years where we have an awesome listserv where the growers are really aggregating information, you know, 20 people answering a question and when 18 of them say the same thing, it may not be replicated res research with statistical analysis, but it's pretty darn real. And we have, you know, a newsletter where growers report in instead of me telling them what to do. They talk about what's going on. And of course, we have the usual, you know, conferences in the winter and farm meetings. But it's just the whole the whole thing for me is it comes down to social capital and creating these these affinity communities, communities of practice, whatever you want to call them, where the people are the core and the information follows to to serve them. So it's a little different way that extension works in a lot of places or the way that I was trained is that you use science, you figure things out, you give people the answer. But in the real world the answer is often complicated and nuanced and site specific. It's not a recipe, it's a way to think about how to achieve what you're trying to achieve with the resources you have. So so I love my job because every day I learn something new and I get to work with great people doing something really real, which is making you know my elevator speech to a fourth grader is I help farmers grow healthy food, and that's what I'm trying to do. And my other job is I am coordinator of Northeast SARE, which is a USDA grants program, Sustainable Agriculture Research and Education. And it's kind of a great little nugget within USDA. I think of it as the like R&D think tank, and we fund farmers, farmer grants. It's one of the only places where a farmer can write a simple application, get $15,000 to try new ideas. They have to share, document what they do and share the info. We have a graduate student grant program, a partnership grant program where people like me work on farms to do things working with the farmer, but the farmer's not controlling the project like we do in farmer grants. And then we have bigger grants, research and education, which tend to be more big replicated trials or big educational programs. Um, and professional development grants, which are to help Extension and NRCS, other agencies, get with the Sustainable Ag Program. So we give out about four million dollars a year and almost a couple hundred different grants. It's so it's a lot of administration for me, but it's exciting because it's you know back in the day, it's over, it's almost thirty years old now. It was pioneering people doing direct marketing, CSAs, organic pasture. And now it's moving into kind of sustainable ag 2.0, which is more food systems. So there's a lot of urban agriculture, food hubs, you know, environment, pollinator habitat, um, new crops. So, so that's my world. And then this all prompted me to think, you know, more about. I feel like part of my job is putting out fires. What's what are the issues here and now? A farmer has pests, or they're trying to design a cover crop plant, or use fertilizers. But then sort of where the heck's the whole thing going is more the food system question. What what can we do to influence the bigger structures? So that's what I wanted to talk to you more about today and show some slides, some of the things that I've been thinking about. And I did work on a book with my colleague recently that tried to capture some of these and I sent a chapter or two your way. I don't know if you got to We did got to read that or not, but um, Either way, I'm going to show you some slides. Feel free to butt in. I'm not, you know, we don't have to get through them all. Definitely want to leave some time for discussion. Yep, we did read the uh, chapters in the book. Oh, good. Yeah. Well, I forgot what I wrote anyway, so <laughs> here we go. So can you see that? No. Nope. No. That's, I just did the PowerPoint. How do I make it show? Oh, I have to maybe have push to another button. Skype. Yeah. How about that? No. Still no. Wow. Um, I'm going to have to do show screen or something. It's always complicated. Let's see. Maybe. Yeah, I want to exit out of full screen and hmm. see if it's coming through in like the chat or something. Do what? 
You want to exit full screen and see if it's coming through when a different part of the stage? Okay. I'm going to um, check on this here, too. So you can still see me, right? Yep. Okay, so I have to do something that says show screen, I think. Let's see. The bottom us. right, is it coming in messages? Uh, here. No. Um, hmm. Do you have your um, show show images in chat selected under view? View. I have under view. I have split window view, full screen profile. Oh. I don't have those things. Hmm. Might be a PC. Tools options. Are you using Mac or PC? Um, PC. Okay. We are using Mac, that would be oh. why we have different things. Let's see. I think it has to be within the yeah, same. Man. Yeah, I'm sure there's a way to do this. I'm looking on my end too to see if there's yeah, general settings. I just went out there. It's like awesome. The other thing, I guess I could send you the PDF and you could just show it, walk through it. Yeah. Um, let's see. Video settings. Advanced. Um, Should be a share screen somewhere, but. It was under conversations. Oh, was yeah, under conversations, there was a share screen. screen. Have that conversation. Name book. Share screen. It's like middle. Which one? Right there's a share screen. Right above where you're. Sure. That's for him. I oh, okay. So do you have a thing under your Skype menu that says uh, conversations? Uh, it's a drop yes. down. Yes. Uh -huh. Do you have something that says share screen? Nope. Oh, okay. Add uh, people, rename, find. Hmm. Ah, share screen is under call. Okay. Let's try that. Share your screen. I'll be darned. Mm -hmm. uh, start. Yep. Yay. Oh, yeah, okay. Okay. That work? Um, we see a desktop. Well, wait, wait, we see wait, like wait, wait, desktop. Wait for it. Oh. Um, start. Says I'm sharing. Hmm. Yeah, we see your desktop still. He's got to have it, it pulled up. Oh, do you do you on your computer? Do you have the PowerPoint pulled up? Yep. Oh. Maybe it's just. Nope. Oh, oh yeah. here we go. Okay. I think it's a lag. Yeah, I think there may be a, a lag. So a, we'll go ahead and try that. <laughs> okay. Moving right along to the beginning, half an hour later. Okay. Here. Um, yeah. yeah. So, do you see the, um, on your computer, the, the Skype thing? Yeah, you if you can see. move that down. Yeah, yeah, there we go. That's great. Okay, that's what we're doing. So, you see the scale on the food system? Yes. Yeah, we got it. Okay. So, it's just, you know, there's a lot of different ways to think about the food system, obviously, and some of it's um, a mishmash of, you know, the individual isn't a geographic region really, but it is a physical space all the way, and you have several individuals, a household, all the way up to global. So what's interesting in a way is the things we've been talking about so much, the regional and the local food system are the most poorly defined. The other ones, we know what they are. You know what a nation is, you know what a household is, but this regional local line is, is not bright. And a lot of people conflate the two and it's actually starting to be a little problematic because I think more and more of us are coming to the conclusion, you know, that re regional food systems are really where we want to go, and especially when you have a bunch of small states that really can't realistically do a good job of feeding themselves. But, you know, New England and New York might have been one state if we were settled from west to east instead of east to west. So some of these local boundaries and state boundaries are just artificial things. They make sense to work in those boundaries because of regulatory 
and um, you know legislative processes and stuff but when it comes to how we're going to grow meats and vegetables and fruits and proteins and that, that they're not so sensible so it's just important to be clear which scale you're talking about when you have different food system conversations and then there's this concept about the market levels of the food system which are not the same thing as that kind of physical geographical scale um, although they do relate so obviously lower in this box here when you're talking about people producing for their own families or the direct to consumer market or directly to stores those are the things we're usually talking about in a local food system and then you start to get into you're going to a distributor who's going to a bunch of stores in an area is it still local is it regional I mean there are some legal definitions of local but even those vary widely um, you know, in Vermont, it's I think 40 miles as the crow flies, or um, and uh, what is it in the last farm bill? It was 300 or 400 miles, depending on which program. So, again, I'm not all hung up on having a perfect definition. It's just being clear what you're talking about. But the real point here is, as you go up the chain, the information is more and more opaque to the consumer till you get to commodities. And the whole definition of a commodity is it's sort of interchangeable foodstuffs. So hog bellies, pork bellies are pork bellies, and it doesn't matter where they come from, they're all supposed to be pretty much the same. Same goes for, you know, soybean oil at the commodity level. Or, so these things are traded, um, and they have to be standardized, and they have a common price. They don't have any of these other kinds of identifiers of place or quality and then you know you start to get some differentiation so like there's an Idaho potato but Idaho has enough potatoes that that's a commodity in and of itself so there's you know millions of pounds of those potatoes so they can differentiate but it's still not like you know what farm or anything um, so this is a pretty important concept that people don't often really think about of which level of the market are you working at and then to make it more complicated, a lot of farms are working at multiple levels. Um, so most of the veg farms I work with, for example, they have direct markets, and they're doing some, you know, direct wholesale or wholesale right to their local stores, for example. And some of the bigger farms, if they have extra, they take it to a terminal market, which is where it's going out as a as a commodity. So it's not simple, but these are, without understanding these concepts, the conversations get muddled. And then there's this whole idea of what, so what is this system? And it can be very simply conveyed or very complicated. So I like things, you know, that kids could understand, which is you have some production, you get some processing, resources are used, waste are generated, and the things are moving around and exchanged and then the consumer eats it. Um, that's one way the diagram we put together for the UVM food system spire proposal in 2010 was a lot more complicated. It separated out kind of the whole uh, part where the food is grown and processed and packaged and moved around. And then the part about the people, can they get the food, what's their culture, they eat it, what's the effect on health and well-being, then the environment from air to water to soil, and then you have things affecting these three spheres. So there's all the things about the people's belief and politics and information, and there's inputs going in, energy and water and labor, and, and then there's stuff going out. Um, so. And we, there's a lot, I've collected a whole bunch of these diagrams, I find them interesting. I took them out of this talk because you can go on and on. But if you look at like the Center for Disease Control food system design, there's very little about food in it. There's one little piece. It's all about human wellness and effects on different, um, different kinds of effects on people and the healthcare system. And, and so I tend to talk about this. It's like you're looking at a multi-dimensional structure, like a house, you know. You, you could approach it from the north to the south, east to the west, it's going to look different and you're going to see different things. If you could see through it, you'd see plumbing, 
you'd see wiring, you'd see ventilation, you'd see um, you know flooring and cooking and refrigerate. So there's a lot of stuff in there. It's all working together in some way. Um, so of course the challenge of the system is it'll make you crazy trying to uh, grapple with everything at once. So the way I think of it is the idea is to have an understanding that that other stuff that's you know two steps removed from what you're working on exists and is connected and there's going to be influences you still are, have to focus down to get anything done but you don't ignore the fact that there's going to be consequences outside of the areas you're working in and the you know can be many steps away even and so that's what you're trying to anticipate and think about and so this whole systems thinking thing is um, the challenge to, to rethink from reductionism where we just focus on our little problem to what are the connections that matter what are the boundaries of the system where how, how far out are we going to look where are the key leverage points where are the um, um, feedback loops and talk a bunch about that in the book using you know say you take a dairy farm some people work at the level of the, the rumen they're just looking at the cow's stomach some people it's the whole cow some people it's the herd. Other people are working on the whole farm and the economics. Other people are working on the whole dairy industry, milk pricing. So you get these different boundaries that totally affect how you view the system. And then there's sustainable agriculture, which isn't the same thing as food systems because it's really focused on the ag part. Although, as I said, this is changing because you can't just focus on growing and selling the food, which was sort of where this at, and not take into account these other pieces of the people and the culture and the inputs and the outputs. So I'm sort of more and more confused about where sustainable ag ends and food systems starts. I don't think it really matters, um, except it's this is the sort of, again, the door we're going through into the system, which for, for share specifically, you know, farmers are our primary we call them beneficiaries. That's the group we're trying to make something good happen for. Consumers and educators and students and gardeners, they're all in there, but that's that's not how we measure our success. It's what, what have farmers done differently? What's improved for farmers? That's our focus. And these three areas are the measures we use. Did something economically um, improve? Was there something in the natural resource area that's better or uh, um, uh, uh, pollution you know mitigated and what's going on with the community is there, are there better policies is there more access to food is there more um, you know environmental services that help help the community in some other way um, so it's the three legs of the stool and quality of life some people add as a fourth leg I could sort of be in there in the community C cuts across all of them so I just wanted to show you some pictures of Vermont farms and what they exemplify. And um, one thing a lot of people do talk about are these direct markets. And they, in a way, they get too much attention in the local food system. And vegetables and fruits that I work in get a lot of attention too, even though in Vermont there's a relatively small part of ag, although they're, they're booming. Um, because they're sort of so prominent and they sort of epitomize this. It's easy to connect to a veg farm and go buy them. It's, it's not the same with fluid milk or, you know, meats and things like that. There tends to be barriers to direct uh, interaction with the farmers. Um, but these things are all booming. This is Lilac Ridge Farm in Brattleboro, which is a great example. It was a conventional dairy. They added horticulture. They've had maple syrup, Christmas trees. They've converted to organic, they conserve their land, there's three generations, it's just kind of um, a great story of so many things um, going well and being well thought of. You know, they have challenges like any farm, but it's a cool story. Um, and so what are farmers after? It's, you know, this connection is part of it, it feels good for a lot of people to know your producer and all that, but the food itself, you know, that, that isn't going to work with crappy food. People want fresh, high quality. Um, they do like the idea that their money is cycling in their community. And this whole thing, trust, social capital, whatever you want to call that, more and more I work in this, I come to just really 
see the importance of these relationships, especially as we get into more and more of an anonymous, you know, fake world with this, all these products with fake farmers on them and fake farm names, and you don't know who's trying to snooker you with marketing. And so you go to a real place and you see the people and it's real food. That resonates for a lot of people. It's still a small part of the population, but um, it's it's important. And the farmers obviously are understanding they have to cultivate these relationships. Um, and then farmers do a great job. Look at this fantastic display of it's nothing fancy, but it just speaks to that they care about their food. And they're totally honest. These signs say, this is ours, it's organic, we grew this, this is from a farm down the valley. These are conventional peaches from Massachusetts. So they're just totally transparent about what they're selling you. And you can choose. Um, but I should say they don't go to the wholesale market, you know, and buy bananas to sell conventional bananas from a big, you know, corporate distributor. So there's there's some limit on how far afield they go from their own stuff. Um, so farmers markets, so that's roadside stands, which sometimes they actually get undersold. It's the biggest direct market outlet for um, produce, but it doesn't. It's not as sexy sometimes as things like farmers markets and CSAs. And we have the worst. The we have, the data is worse for roadside stands than these other markets. We just don't know how many are out there and what they're actually selling. They have so many different kinds of products they buy in. You know, breads and eggs and. Some have potato chips and soda, who knows? Some are more like a mixture of stores and farms. So they're a hard thing to assess. The farmers markets, they're good numbers on. And they've been booming nationwide and in Vermont. And now moving into winter farmers markets, um, which is exciting to just see direct market is not a stagnant thing. And the same with CSAs. When I started 25 years ago, there weren't any in Vermont. And now they're well over 100. and. So instead of everybody going head to head for fresh produce, we're starting to see um, diversified CSAs with meats and eggs and flowers and now winter shares and fruit shares. And so there's sort of like snowflakes, no two are alike, and they're um, very different. And they range from oh, 600 families at the Interville Community Farm in Burlington to some CSAs with just a handful. and and we have now this mixture of farms that had roadside stands forever are now also offering CSAs, or sometimes it's just membership. You get a card, you get a discount. It's just interesting that people want to belong to farms. That's not for everybody, but it's something the farmers are recognizing. And Vern, um, yes, I was wondering if you could go back to this last slide before that one because the writing at the bottom was blocked and I just wanted to maybe you oh. could read us that writing or the words there okay uh, there were over 8,000 farmers markets nationwide and um, there were 80 in Vermont uh, a couple of years ago up from 19 in 1986 and at that time a couple of years ago 14 percent were winter markets okay. thank you but they keep growing are you able to see the other, the writing on this one? On the, yeah. Okay. Thanks. And so I've been lucky that the area I work in has just really been booming. You know, in the last 10 years, the number of farms growing vegetables doubled. Most of these new ones are small, and but I always argue it, big farms don't drop out of the sky. People start at a manageable scale and some grow and some don't and some fail and some make it just like any industry um, but it you know produce is a pretty easy access compared to you know a lot of animal cultures very capital intensive milk and equipment barns so people can start with a little csa go to farmers market get off the ground but there are a whole number of farms like this tunbridge hill farm it's windy healthy so former dairy farms i mean we used to have thousands and thousands across the state that it, and so a lot of those converted to other uses and they started small and but they are this is their job and they raise their family and pay their bills and they just grow produce and they have a csa and they go to uh, some farmers markets and they sell to the food co-op so they have a mixture of markets and berry production is also booming again lots of small farms um but i love this picture bob gray is a great strawberry grower and um you can see they also they actually bought that dairy and 
turned it into a small uh, cheese making operation and they have greenhouses and they grow their own cover crops and grains and um, a lot of great a lot of great people doing amazing growing out there just so much knowledge and this is a little hard to see but it just shows this is the New England Ag Stats that um, these farm farms are doing lots of different kinds of markets so I know Vermont's second one up from the bottom New England there so you can see about half the Half the fruit and vegetable farms have a farm stand. About a quarter do pick your own. Uh, about a third have, go to farmers markets. Three percent have mail order. Uh, Seventeen percent to CSAs, which is higher than any of the other states. Six percent is other, which could be like restaurant sales. Um, but then the one on the right, direct to retail. So that's going to your local food co-op or general store or supermarket. And so about a third of the farms are doing that. And then 17% are going to wholesale market. So that's to a distributor or to a bulk buyer for a supermarket. So this all adds to way more than 100. You can just see their farms are really mixing it up. And it sometimes changes from year to year what they do. Any questions on this one? It's a little complicated. So... Just to not only talk about vegetables, dairy is obviously the biggest ag industry in Vermont using by far most of the land and um, most of the gross sales, you know, three quarters to 80 percent, depending on how there's, there's fluid milk, there's hay, there's uh, beef cows coming off of dairies. So what's interesting is, is milk production has held fairly steady, but this industry has really consolidated um, you know, there were 2,500 dairy farms when I started 25 years ago, and so we're down to about 900 or something now. They've gotten bigger, more efficient. You know, people sometimes wrap these as bad big farms. They're not. They're not particularly big in the greater scheme of things. I mean, the average herd side in California is over 700 cows. So, oh, shit. you know, we we have pretty small farms, and they're pretty darn well managed these are you know I've moved my stake a lot of this and I like taking students out to visit these people are trying to do a really good job they're highly regulated there you know there's issues when you have animals and you have lots of manure you have the land to spread it and these big farms here many of them have digesters now where they're putting the manure in making energy um, so for me, this whole battle of big farm versus small, organic versus conventional, local versus re is, is nonsense. I, I don't know. My view is all kinds of farms should, can do a better job and should try and should be supported. You know, the, the true factory farms with tens of thousands of animals is not something I think makes sense just ecologically. There are just so many vulnerabilities and so many challenges involved the manure and the water issues and the gas, that, that, that's really where the big problems are. But, um, you know, this is, um, oh, I think Gladstone's farm up in um, Newbury. So when you have, whatever, a thousand farm cows and 2,000 acres and um, pasture land and corn, and you know, it, it, there's ways to make that be fairly ecological. Um, now there's things people don't like. Most of these farms use GMO corn and Soybeans, like most of the rest of the conventional growing world, that's sort of a separate argument. But, um, you know, this whole issue of it's easy to be nimby and say we don't want these things here, but if you're going to drink milk or eat meat or eat grains, I'd rather we do it under our own um, sphere of influence and try and do the best job we can than pretend that these things aren't going to occur and let them happen somewhere else. But what is staggering is that there's been a lot of consolidation at the very highest level of farm size and that just a few percent of U.S. farms produce the vast bulk of our food. I mean, look at that number, it's staggering. Four percent of farms produce two-thirds of all the food. And some of these farms, I mean, the biggest potato farms, biggest vegetable farms, like you know, are like 50,000 acres. There's only like four or five thousand acres of vegetables in all of Vermont, so you're just talking at a whole <laughs> another planetary scale, and um, 
And so that's good for making quote unquote cheap food, but um, I'm not a big fan of huge consolidation. I think distributed systems are more buffered ecologically and politically and energy wise. And so um, we, you know, it's time for policies to shift to recognize it's not like you have to not have any big farms, but I think policy is shifting to say it's good to have more small farms too. They bring something that big farms don't. And small farms control most of the land. That seems, you know, the 90% um, of the smallest farms control like two thirds of all the, all the land in the country. So if you want to have vital rural communities, you got to keep these small farms vibrant. Can you do us a favor and uh, on yes. that last slide, can you read the bottom text to us? There, the reason that we can't see it is on Skype, our video chat boxes okay. are in the way, and I don't know how to move those. Okay. So. <laughs> so it says in 2012, only 4% of all U.S. farms produced 66% of the $395 billion in agricultural products. And, you know, unless you're selling some raw milk or you're bottling milk on the farm, most milk is shipped out to the regional market. So this is another thing we say, oh, that's not local. Well, like most of it goes to Boston, 100 or 150 miles away, depending on where you are. And um, so a lot of the dairy farmers say, well, it is a local product. It goes there, it's, right, you know, it's bottled within a day and consumed fresh quickly. So just how you frame things. Um, but this is our number one product by far. So the reality check is the vast majority of people get their food from the supermarket. Um, and you know, I get a lot of food from the supermarket, even though I belong to a CSA and I belong to the food co-op and I shop at the farmer's market. Um, and so my pitch to people is, the goal I think is to be intentional about what you're buying. It's not like you have to make some part of the food system evil. Uh, my local Hannaford's buys tons of vegetables and apples from local producers too. So, you know, they're trying. Um, but there's also a lot of stuff, especially in the process section, that is part of this other system that has issues. And one of the issues is that there's only a handful of companies controlling most of those products. And they're sort of invisible because they own all these brands that make you think they're all different companies, but they're not. So Nestle is the biggest food company in the world. And this is a year or something old, but you know, 6,000 brands, 110 billion in annual revenue. So a good way to find out about these companies is to go to their, you know, the sites they prepare, prepare for stockholders and find out, you know, they tout their reach and their breadth and their sales and it is what it is is how our system works but um i just get pissed off when something says you know such and such farm and it's not a farm it's a bottling plant owned by a multinational so i, I just think a, you know that word should be treated with more respect and we should have more point of origin information about where the stuff's coming from so uh, we'll get into this a little later but consumers should have a lot more information than they have and so that because i think you know, and the book talks about this. The core problem we have is people are investing in things they don't believe in, that don't match their values. So we're we're supporting a food system, and um, you know, uh, we are our own obstacles to change because we invest in <laughs> stuff we don't know about that we wouldn't invest in if we knew about it. Um, and so, just here's a little diagram of just to show basically a dozen companies control, I don't know what the number is, you know, 90% of the products in the supermarket. So there's two big, two big uh, personal products, Procter & Gamble and Johnson & Johnson, and then, you know, you can see that, you know, you've heard these names, Unilever, Mars, Kellogg's, General Mills, Procter & Gamble, Nestle's Kraft, Coke, but, and then they're buying and selling these things among themselves and, and then sometimes renaming companies. So how would a consumer know and how could you possibly even wrap your mind around this? But one thing I do at least at the supermarket is I kind of try and look for family owned companies or co-ops or, you know, they are there like, um, I don't know, orange juice I pick, Florida's natural, it says it's a co-op of growers in Florida that own this company, whereas 
Tropicana is, I forget, PepsiCo or Coke or something. So these aren't huge decisions I'm making, but I'm, I'm trying to buy food that aligns more with my values and supports, kind of supports the little guy in the system. So, you know, the reason I do that is this, this multinational control that depends on consolidation for low cost materials to make the products um, creates some kind of disturbing <laughs> scenario. So like people don't see this is how you get a cheap hamburger is to have these giant feedlots of beef that are ecologically unsound and challenging in a lot of ways. Um, you know, it was an eye opener for me to go see giant broiler houses in Delaware and just how, how you get cheap chicken breasts. And, um, and so this anonymity doesn't let the consumer see this. And to top it off, it externalizes the cost. So when the manure goes into the streams and does what it does in the Chesapeake Bay, somebody else has to pay for that. And it's you and me in, in tax dollars. So the, the faults of these systems come back as cost to us that are not in the food. Um, and many people argue it's in, in healthcare too, when you're eating things with all the antibiotics that go into meat and blah, 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 blah. Um, so we don't have true cost accounting and we don't have the transparency. But then I get excited on the other hand, you know, when people start to realize, whoa, healthy meat where the animals are, have a good life and they're not having to be treated with things and the meat actually tastes better and your heritage breeds or whatever. So where I've come to is, yeah, it costs more. You're sort of paying for it directly without paying for those other things. So eat less higher quality <laughs> meat and feel better about it. That's my personal pitch. Um, and so we've also, of course, you probably heard this, we've separated the animals from the crops. So you have to buy the fertilizer to produce the crop and that has other consequences. Um, so it does bring the price down on the face of it, um, but this specialization has consequences because it reduces diversity and it makes the system vulnerable. There's, it's not buffered against, oh, well, if that thing didn't work out, I can do this other thing. Um, and so you also have vegetable production in California, which is totally vulnerable now. I mean, they didn't plant, forget the number, 800,000 acres or something last year no water um, so what you know we can grow broccoli here pretty darn well but we've seeded that to a place that brought the cost down by specializing and had better resources in some ways growing season but I think you know to me it's low-hanging fruit stuff man apples broccoli squashes you know beef cows deer there's a lot of stuff we can do pretty well here and there's a great study um, of uh, looking at the New England food system and trying to project how we could grow, I forget, is it 60% of our own food by 2060, something like that. And they come to the conclusion, there are lots of things we can do well. We can meet all our own vegetables, all our temperate fruits. We've got to ramp up the seafood. We can do the dairy and the beef, but like grains are, are tough. We're not really a great area for growing grains. So that may make more sense to import from somewhere else. So it's again, I think the phrase that I kind of like is self-reliance. We're trying to get more self-reliant, not completely self-sufficient, but do the things we can really do here. And I know I want to keep drinking coffee and eating chocolate mm -hmm. and bananas and support those communities far away that grow those things. So it's not like um, everything's going to be local or regional or even national. So then without the land, it's all sort of a moot point and land use planning is a really challenging thing for a lot of reasons, but Vermont has really been a model state led by the Vermont Land Trust in conserving farms and um, targeting them for good soil. Lots of forest conserved too. This has helped a lot of the vegetable growers I work with get on the land, brings the cost of the land down by um, buying the easement and then it's only has the value for agricultural use, not for development. Um, so doing this sooner rather than later, once you have a lot of developmental pressure, it's uh, more of a challenge. In the book, I worked on the chapter on farmland protection and preservation, and there, I learned a lot. You know, those are two different things. And and long story short, the 
the scholarship of this area shows that it's you need to combine approaches. So conservation easements are one thing, but there are also um, zoning practices and right to farm laws and farm viability programs that help farms be economically viable and have business plans. And you know when you put all several or more of these things into a package, that's when you really have success. One thing alone. So just conserving land without help, helping farmers have viable markets, for example, doesn't really work. Um, and just you know creating markets but not addressing escalating land costs doesn't work either. So you got to think holistically. Just have to talk about maple syrup here in Vermont because it is the one thing we're number one in nationwide, and there's a lot of uh, sugaring across the landscape. And it's also interesting, this this is a product that does have point of origin regulations. It's really the only one to my knowledge where you cannot say Vermont maple syrup um, if it's not from Vermont. And there are um, some strict penalties and then there are all these uh, standards for the different grades of maple syrup. Those have recently changed but um, it's kind of an example. If we did this for all of our products, um, I think that would be have some interesting positive consequences. And then we have all of these niche markets, so they aren't going to carry the day by themselves, whether it's um, artisan cheese or there's tons of stuff going on with you know breweries and distilleries now using trying to use more and more local products. Um, we have people making um, different meat products, uh, lots of stuff going on with sauces and jams for a long time and um, goes on and on and on, additional herbs, etc. So I like to think about these multiple benefits. I think of them as economies of scope instead of economies of scale. The economy of scale thing is just looking at the economics and the price per unit, what it takes to make it. And aside from that, it's externalizing a lot of things. There are again things we have that we would value, but we don't have a good way of monetizing. So if we use less energy, lost, had less erosion, have lower greenhouse gas emissions, had greater resilience to extreme weather events. These are all things peop most people would say, oh, those are desirable. They, they have value. Um, but we don't have good ways, not only to put a value on them, to, but to let people pay for them. Um, and so that'll be one of our challenges going forward is to get the consumer dollar, you know, allow a way for people to pay some more for these things, especially people that have disposable income. So obviously, people that are stressed economically, this is not high on their list, but there are plenty of people dropping $4 on lattes that would chip in you know, an extra 25 cents a gallon for milk if they knew some attribute about it. And the example I often use is cow power, um, where you can sign up on your electric bill to pay more per kilowatt hour to support renewable energy projects on dairy farms. You don't even get those electrons directly, it's all going into a pool, um, but thousands of people have signed up to pay extra because they think that's something that's valuable. I haven't heard the phrase economies of scope. I gotta say I love that. <laughs> oh good. So, and here's a great example of it. I show this slide a lot because Carl Hammer, from, this is Vermont Compost Company in Montpelier, just has a system that exemplifies that economies of, of scope and, and systems thinking and interconnectedness. So, you know, most people that raise eggs, that raise chickens to lay eggs, buy grain. And the grain comes from the Midwest, largely, and costs a bunch of money. If you're trying to do it it costs a ton of money. And there's all of the footprint of the fertilizer and the greenhouse gases and the transportation that's totally ignored. Um, and to keep eggs cheap, you have to put tens or hundreds of thousands of chickens together in one place and turn it into a factory kind of approach. So here Carl has his chickens that are uh, eating food waste and the insects and the compost on the food waste. So the food waste is collected locally from schools and um, 
the local college and the food haulers, you know, the solid waste district involved, it comes here, it's dumped onto this, onto piles of, that are sort of the beginnings of compost. The chickens are in this house that's a bedded pack with lots of hay and straw and they lay eggs. So he buys no grain and he's actually getting a tipping fee, right, to take this food waste. And of course the collectors have to be trained so there's no contamination and there's a lot of issues here too. You've got to keep rodents out and birds and it's complicated, but he's a pioneer working these things out. But long story short, he makes eggs, he makes the manure that goes into compost. The compost, much of it is made into potting soil that goes to local organic vegetable growers. And if you think what's really cool is the, the food waste isn't traveling more than, you know, a few dozen miles and the eggs are all going locally and the compost bunch of it's local, some does go further afield, um, but what I get excited about is think about how many other towns could do this, you know, lots and lots. This is not rocket science, it's agroecology, and we just, you know, need to, this is a project on my list, to work with him and write up more how this worked, what were the challenges, the pros and cons, the costs, and, and find ways to get these kinds of systems set up more. And now that Vermont passed Act 148, which is going to prohibit food waste from going into landfills, it's going to be a really ripe time to um, get systems like this set up. So this is the, there's a lot of scope in here and actually scale gets problematic, right? If you make this thing too big, food waste is moving a long way. There's a lot more waste to deal with. The local market can't handle the eggs you make. So I like this uh, idea of uh, distributed systems. That also goes with economy of scope. You have lots of little pods of people doing this in slightly different ways, learning from each other, fitting their landscape and community, rather than trying to mush them all into one giant enterprise where they sort of have to detach from their communities because the reach is too far away over the hill where you don't really know or care what's happening there. Can you say his name one more time? Uh, Carl Hammer and his Vermont Compost Company. And he's just one of the many, you know, geniuses I feel blessed to work with, the people who have just figured these things out and persevered against lots of serious challenges um, to make something happen and you know it's sort of invisible like how would you know people don't the story's not widely told but we have a lot of great models um, and I think of it as you know in ecology there's refugia where you have little pockets where like an ecosystem that was wiped out by a glacier or a volcano or something there's a place where it survived and the rest it comes back from and so that's that's one thing over the years I've come to realize, you know, even if these things aren't widespread or widely accepted or people poo-poo them as marginal or niche, and, and people that come to Vermont from Iowa or some, some you know, conventional people will say that, ah, you got, it's like boutique agriculture or something. I feel like, you know what, setting up these models that we can learn from as times change and resources get diminished or who knows what kind of climate challenges come up, it's going to be important to not have a blank slate where we're like, how do we go from an industrial factory farm to a community-based ag? So we need, these models are more important than people realize to give us some level of understanding of where we're going to have to go in the next several generations. What did you call these kinds of systems or models? I'm sorry? What would you call these kinds of systems or models? Well, you know, they're, I think agroecology is, is a good term that you're, you know, the challenge is you're fundamentally disturbing the ecosystem to make food, but you're trying to, under, you know, utilize ecological principles and do it in a balanced way that minimizes the negative consequences. Um, and that's a really remarkable tension when you think about it, that um, there's no way it's going to be pure nature. I mean, even hunting and gathering and changing populations of things. Um, and the more you know, food you try and make in one place, usually the more disturbance you have. So how do you pick the right disturbances, manage them in the right way? It's And, and there's a I talk a bunch about this in the book under, um, um, in the environment chapter. So 
What's interesting is a lot of what's happening in conventional ag is incremental change, taking a sort of industrial system and trying to do some better things. And like right now, soil health and cover cropping is big. On I mean, we have 150 million acres of corn in this country, so I, I'm glad that those farmers are thinking more about soil health and starting to cover crop. And um, but that's different than transformation which is you get the animals back on the farms, you get more smaller farms, more people on the land, more local and regional markets. So there again is this tension. They, they both are good and they both need to happen. Um, but I'm a little confused myself of like, how do you get to transformation? I mean, unless you have a revolution and you say, we're not gonna do any of that the way we used to, I think you have incremental change and then you get these little quantum leaps of like whoa something shifts and you suddenly really change the way you you do something um and again the transformation often are these little examples of like somebody's got a whole different system that they're using to make the same food and um someday that might spread widely and become the norm it's, you just don't know when And so again, you take meat, think about how you know, we see Food Inc. and how most of the meat's raised. This is Paul Harlow in Westminster, and he's got a young man working for him that's raising pigs. I mean, you go out there, it's incredible. The pigs are jumping up in the alfalfa that's up above their heads, and they're only 20 or 30 at a time, and they're slaughtered at a slaughterhouse in that town, and sold to the North End Butchers in Brattleboro and other local markets. Um, and again, they cost more on the face of them, but what are all these other costs? But I just get excited that there are farmers that are really trying to make really healthy food, not just for the people, for the animals, for their farms that they're on, and they're increasingly getting recognized, um, and so that's good. And right now we sort of have these two parallel systems, and that's the reality is there's an industrial track and stuff in the food in the supermarkets and then there's this more local slash regional track with uh, these other values embedded in them and um, other um, kinds of markets so of course one key challenge is the food access thing so because these local foods tend to cost more in the market there's a lot of concern about are we shutting out low-income people and how does how do we address that and so you know I have two responses to that one is it's not necessarily the farmers job to level the playing field for everybody as I said there's people spending four dollars on cups of coffee and why shouldn't they buy fifteen dollar a pound cheese and you know six dollar a pound hamburger too and help those farmers survive so the first step is build those markets then we find other ways and it's starting to happen like with vegetables there's gleaning programs there are um, I'll talk in a minute food hubs that are delivering lower cost things so just don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. If we can shift some of our excess disposable income to higher quality food, that's good. But don't take our eye off the ball of also trying to increase access. And um, farm to school, you're going to talk about that tomorrow, is, is one way that that is happening also. Um, and then it's exciting, just new products. And sometimes it's full circle coming back. So Vermont was the bread basket for wheat. And the, Civil War, I guess, around Lake Champlain. And there was even a wheat breeder in Vermont, Cyrus Pringle, and some of the genetics he developed were in, are still in modern wheat varieties, uh, Champlain and Defiant. And, um, and Heather Darby, I guess you're supposed to meet with, has worked with folks, uh, bakers and farmers and folks in Maine are working on this too. And they're gonna release a new variety of wheat in Vermont, I think first one in a century and you know Red Hen Bakery is it's just so great to go buy a loaf of bread that's made with wheat from four farms in Vermont so this is a cool extension model what Heather and, and others are doing more and more is you don't just breed the wheat in isolation on the university farm you know you have bakers in there from day one working with farmers giving feedback so the research trials happen the farmers grow it out they say, hey, I love this one, it yields so much. And the bakers say, that's terrible for making bread. We can't, so you go back to finding the things that are gonna work for the markets as well as for the farmers and um, build that community that's interested in having a local wheat supply.
and then you have great farmers like Brent Beidler, just just sharp and innovative and totally on board to try new things and document them. And that's a critical piece of extension that we have these partnerships. Um, then we have creative people like Pete Johnson who started with just greens and he does a great job of that. Here's his beautiful farm, Craftsbury. But then he's and he's out really in the middle of nowhere. You can't sell all this product in a town of, I don't know, what, well, who, who's up at Sterling? How big is Craftsbury? Like 500 people? Probably. Yeah. <laughs> so he's got seven full-time employees, I think, and now up to three farms. And But Burlington has a lot more people. And um, I showed you Harlow Farm before. He's going to Whole Foods in you know, Boston and New York. There's a lot of population around. You just go a little ways. Um, but Pete's worked with other farms for these kind of whole basket CSAs where you're getting local yogurt and bread and mushrooms and um, and putting things into smaller scale tractive packaging and pre-washing and so just doing really great creative things. Um, so lucky to have these folks that are braving these frontiers. And then an area I work in a lot is, is season extension and so I used to call them greenhouses, but really more and more they're high tunnels. So they're plastic covered structures that may or may not be heated or heated just a little bit. Um, but greenhouse tomatoes have um, boomed and part of it's the flavor and quality of the fruit. But we're starting to see more leafy greens growing through the winter and you know, raspberries and all kinds of things in tunnels. So that's important to protect against erratic weather and deal with the fact that we it's cold here a lot and we can gain an extra month growing or more on either side got a lot more local product and the other thing that's happening that I didn't talk so much now is the storage so I have a colleague Chris Callahan in engineering ag engineering who's done amazing things to help growers monitor the conditions in their storage so they really know what the temperature and the humidity um, are and they can that makes crops last a lot longer and they of course are working on insulating properly and everything saving energy but you know just in the past couple of years we have, have so much more supply of potatoes winter squash onions cabbage it goes the list goes on and on of you're starting to get to more of a year-round food supply I mean there's farmers that still are selling well I just showed Pete's greens he's one of our partners just got an email forwarded from Chris there still selling potatoes and other root crops from last year that are coming out of their storage. Um, so that's really interesting that um, those are you know, nutrient dense foods with a lot of carbs. They tend to be lower cost, back to the food access thing than a greenhouse tomato. Um, so I'm very excited about the storage crop possibilities for the future. And then another genius, John Williamson, you know, I visited him, I don't know, 15 years ago, and he said, I want to I want to grow all my own fuel. I said, that is so cool. <laughs> How can I help? So a whole set of partnership of extension folks and got a Department of Energy grant and Vermont Sustainable Jobs Fund, and he's got an on-farm oil seed processing and biodiesel production in a, in a good-sized barn, and now he's getting more into grains. And then what's, so here's back another economy of scope thing. So how does, how does biodiesel work generally at like the commodity industrial level? I'll ask a quiz even though I can't see you. Yeah, sure. what's, what's the basic outline of that process? Ask the question again. Yeah, ask the question one more time. Now, how would you describe, like how do you think biodiesel is made in this country as far as, you know, the way it works with the, with the crops and the, and the, and the market? Soy, is, soy is the main ingredient, right? That's yep. Soybeans. Yeah. yeah. Corn, right? No, corn's ethanol. Corn's ethanol, but yeah, it's the same it kind of process. Sunflower. But isn't biodiesel much more have much fewer externalities than ethanol production? Well, yeah, biodiesel has a uh, much better um, energy return on investment. Yep. Um, and of course, again, it's back to the boundaries of analysis. So one thing that works with Biodiesel from soybeans is um, the meal. So you basically these are oil seed crops. You squeeze them to get the oil out. But the soybean meal is very good for feeding animals. It's high in protein, and so then that makes more energy. So um, 
But kind of the thing I'm trying to get at here is those farmers are commodity producers, right? You grow thousands of acres of soybean and thousands of acres of corn. You sell them to some Processing plant water. that's going to make yeah. biodiesel or ethanol. You may not even get that fuel back. You may not be able even to buy it. It goes off on the rail cars to some urban market or whatever. Um, there's just that whole, it's that whole supply chain level of detachment. You're just a soybean grower. You might sell them for feed or for tempeh, wherever it goes, it goes. So they, then these big plants are like 30 million gallon a year, 60 million gallon a year. They squeeze the oil out. They sell the meal as a commodity, soybean meal. The vegetable gets turned into biodiesel, get some glycerin, that goes off as a commodity. So it's it's all economies of scale. We're trying to keep the cost down of that fuel. Economy of scope is different. So here's John Williamson, he squeezes these things. That oil, he might burn it directly in his veg oil tractor or truck, or he might um, turn it into biodiesel. It might go to another farmer who wants to run it in diesel in their tractor. Um, the meal might go um, to an animal farmer. He uses it to make chicken feed. It can be used as fertilizer. It's high protein, high nitrogen, organic fertilizer. It could be, if it gets moldy or something, it could be pelletized, burned as a fuel. So you start to get multiple buyers, multiple markets, multiple uses. And this is what I mean by economies of scope. There's a fabric here of things woven together that buffer the system like with that other system, man, the price of gas drops. I mean, that's what happened to ethanol. Oops, suddenly it doesn't work economically anymore. Or the rail cars aren't there to carry them or whatever. Um, this is this is just a whole different way of thinking. Like how many, it's in e ecology sometimes they call it functional stacking. Like how many different uses can be lined up on one another that provide options so is economically, the environmentally, is the main benefit for the producer that he has more control over his product and, and where it goes? Local. Oh, absolutely. And almost all of his um, markets are relationship-based, right? A farmer comes to him and says, I got these soybeans, I need some fuel. You sell them the soybeans and buy the fuel back. Or a dairy farmer says, I need the meal back, keep the oil. Or I mean, the one story I love with him is I got a call from some cosmetic manufacturer who says, I'm looking for camelina sludge to make my whatever they were making, some, some cream. And John had done some trials. He had camelina. So the sludge is the stuff you squeeze the seeds, you take the oil off, you get the meal, and then some stuff settles out of the oil before you use it. And that's kind of the sludge. So this guy wanted to buy it. John said, I throw that stuff away. You know, I'll just give it to you. But he ended up paying him something but I just that's what I love is like things come out of the woodwork of uses you didn't think about if you're an industrial camelina oil producer you know you gotta it, it's much more rigid and harder you need a big volume to start to divert something somewhere um, and you're dealing with sort of anonymous buyers and markets um, so this is about people and so this is I see a community energy system going with a community food system and it's the same thing we've been working on greenhouses that burn shell corn instead of oil or propane. We're not looking to import Midwest corn to do that. The idea is you have a bunch of dairy farms that don't make milk or have cows anymore. They still have a lot of corn growing equipment. The corn you know, plant is good for the land. When it goes back in, you take the shell corn. It's very high energy, high fuel that can um, be used to heat greenhouses. So it's just different ways of thinking about different and multiple uses for these things we grow. Um, there's lots of challenges and Heather's been working a lot more on this. I don't really work in this area anymore, but you know, everything looks good at the directory level, I like to say. You start to open up the files and you see where the, there's challenges. So birds are a big problem, especially on small plantings. You know, there's different pests, understanding how to fertilize them properly. So all these things have a steep learning curve. John likes to say, you know, we're in first grade. I guess he's probably in third by now. Um, but there's, you know, you read the literature of how they do these things in the Dakotas and stuff. It, you know, that's big scale stuff. They have modern combines. It's different varieties. So we've kind of had to relearn how would you do this at a Vermont scale community level. But it's been one really exciting project. Um, 
This is my former extension office. We moved, but we were on a dairy farm, and we had a youth ag project. And it was a great thing. We still have a youth ag coordinator where kids are using agriculture to learn not just about food, but teamwork and um, you know business and life skills. Um, and again, you're going to talk about this tomorrow, but um, the whole farm to school movement is very rich and nuanced, and it's partly maybe some new markets for farms. It's partly changing um, eating behaviors and dietary outcomes for kids. It's partly the whole cultural learning about food and farming and our um, history and sense of place. And I think that's why it's been so powerful is it it combines a bunch of constituencies and interests and people sort of intuitively know there's a lot of good outcomes that can happen. Some of them are hard to quantify. We'll probably talk about that tomorrow. So just because you put the stuff on the plate, figuring out what the kids actually eat is one challenge. And what does it really mean for their health years down the road is even more complicated. Um, but things sure have moved as far as what's on that plate compared to a couple decades ago. And it's taken off. Again, nobody heard of farm to school 10, 15 years ago. But there's a lot happening, and one sort of issue we have is, if you look in the Northeast, sometimes we think this stuff is going on everywhere, we're a little delusional. <laughs> there's, there's definitely something happening in the food system here, and I think part of it is what a farmer once said to me, the closer my back gets to the wall, the bigger my ears get. So, you know, ag had been kind of marginalized here, and it was in trouble, and 20 years ago, people were talking about agriculture is dying in, in Vermont. I mean, people actually said that. You don't hear that anymore. But partly, people responded to the challenge or the crisis, coming up with all these new ideas and positive approaches to things. And um, so now, sometimes, we just forget that there still are lots of challenges. We haven't got it figured out. And there's lots of places you go where they don't know what you're talking about when you talk about farm to school. Or I get calls from people say, I wish I could get my town or my county or something to, you know, how did you do that in Vermont? And they refer them to uh, feed or people who are more actively engaged than me. And one area I have worked in a little is, is food hubs, and that's another fascinating thing. So it's kind of like it's at, it's where CSAs were at 20 years ago, where they're starting to emerge and there's all different types of them. And people are figuring out what are the economic models and what are the different goals so is the goal increasing access? Is it new markets for farmers? Is it reduced energy? It's sort of, you can have lots of goals, but something's got to be priority. And there are different, different markets and types of farms. So the Interville Food Hub here is working with lots of smaller scale farms generally and aggregating products and selling to a retail customer. And they have different colored baskets. There's different kinds of shares that go out and you know, they're doing great work. Um, Wyndham Farm and Food, which is down here in Wyndham County, is a different creature. It's taking larger farms that are scaling down. Most of those farms and food producers, so this also has, we have a yogurt factory, cheese factory, um, people, you know, bagel maker, granola. Many of those, their stuff was leaving the area. There was, they're, you know, we have 200 acre orchard. They can't, they don't focus on local markets. It's got to go to to the population centers. So they divert some small portion of their foods to this local hub that's based on a farm, uh, Paul Harlow's Westminster Organics. And um, the goal is to get it into institutions to increase access. So it started with schools, but schools don't really buy enough or have enough money. So when you add in the hospitals and the senior centers, um, and some, now they even have a food buying club where uh, it's dropped at a school and communities can order, you know, this is at wholesale price. You can get boxes if you have a certain number of families. So there's just, I'm just saying there's a lot of different ways to go about it. And this, you know, this is, was a mission driven thing. The farmers aren't really, this isn't much market for them. They're not really making more money for doing this. They don't want to lose money, but they want to get more of their local food into their local communities. And um, this has been going for, I think, four or five years now. And there's Hans Estrin, who really was his baby. He started it, and we hired him an extension. And 
uh, and now it's spun off to a nonprofit that's running this thing, and he's doing work on food safety. Yep. So I'm going backwards. And then the last one is just, so for all the interest in local and regional food, it's important to remember we do live in a global food community, and uh, I've been lucky enough to go down to Oaxaca with a continuing education semester abroad and meet people who are doing wonderful things in their communities, growing coffee. And um, so this idea of a value chain, so instead of an anonymous commodity where the coffee just goes off to a whatever gigantic buyer and it's traded and sold and nobody really knows much about it, identifying things about it so that some of that value can go back to this community, they can get more than the, the cheapest commodity price and take care of themselves while they grow a healthy product for people like me is very exciting. The catch, of course, is you can't see people that are thousands of miles away. Um, and that's, so that's why I like to say local food, to me, the, the enthusiasm for it is because it's a proxy for what we want to happen. We want to see good things on the land and people taken care of and the food produced in a healthy way for us. And, and direct markets let us see some of that or get a darn good sense of it by talking to the farmer or seeing their stands, whatever. You start to go far away, now you need some third party verification. Because I don't know, is that really fair trade? Is that like, a, how would I know anything about this product without an intermediary to tell me some things and make sure it's true? The challenge is you start to get messed up with all the different values that people have interest in. So is it taking care of the land and erosion with, with pasture? Is it fair trade? Is it justice for labor? Is it sustainable? seafood, integrated pest management, animal welfare, bird, you know, coffee's amazing. You have bird friendly coffee, fair trade coffee, environmentally friendly coffee, women's co-op coffee. So, you know, the concern is you start to make people crazy because they can't pay attention to all this stuff. Um, so it sort of is what it is. We're not going to have one unifying label and it, it's okay. Uh, of course, the danger comes when there's things out there that, that aren't true or people make stuff up. And um, so, that does take a little digging to um, sometimes figure out what's really going on with fair trade. And even that gets complicated. There's two different international fair trade certification systems now. Um, so I find it all interesting and fascinating. Um, I know, like my family, their eyes just roll when I start off on these things. Um, so we take what we can take. We reach the markets and the attention spans that we can. And, we, and I think the information needs to be adjusted to people's uh, level of interest and capacity to absorb and that's part of what I've learned in extension I mean even with farmers some people want the sound bite on something and some people want the whole book and we need to um, have different um, levels of intensity <laughs> in how we convey this information but we've got to got to continue to convey it otherwise people will shop blindly and as I said continue to invest in a system with problems that they wouldn't you know they wouldn't buy the stuff if they knew what was behind it. So that's my spiel. Well, thanks very much. I think we have time for a few questions. If okay, let's see if I can shut my PowerPoint off without doing damage to the rest of the... Here we go. Back. If you just... Uh... Yeah, turn off your um, share screen. Okay. Let's see, that was in you conversation. Oh man, I making me remember stuff. Stop sharing screen. There you go. Okay. Anybody got a question? Yeah, right off the bat I thought it was very interesting when you kind of took local to a regional level. Because I agree. And, but I understand when you think regionally, you don't have the infrastructure, the control over the groups that you have here in Vermont, because now you're working with other institutions, other NGOs, other governments. Uh, I mean, is your long-term vision roll out a model here in Vermont, which I think you're well on, and to try to extend that into the neighboring New England? Um, well, I... You know, again, I, I'm into this concept of communities of learners. I don't, 
I don't want to be the source of the answer or Vermont to be the answer. We, we have some things we're doing well and some things we're learning. And uh, it's kind of arrogant to think we're going to tell everybody else to do it our way or that. So I think we share, I mean, the wheat project's a good example. Folks in Maine were really into this too. There were some folks in Vermont, they work together. They have some different kind of land available and different kind of farmers. So to me, it's about creating these communities of, of learning and interest around um, and letting people know what we have. And yeah, in some areas we, have, we are leading and we got a lot going on, but it's, you know, it's offensive to others too, to be told here, you know, we've got to figure it out. So I, I think we should document what we can that, and sometimes it's it's mistakes and that be honest about that too. And then just to be clear, I think local is great and some things really make lots of sense, but part of it is you get to some of these products like milk. We can't consume all the milk we produce for one thing and we don't have the bottling plants, and, you know, the markets in Southern New England. So that, that totally makes sense as a regional product. And as I mentioned, the bigger vegetable growers or fruit growers, it's the same thing. So it's just being, I like the word intentional. Where does it make sense to be very close to home? And where does it make sense to start to reach out more? And then you get into grains and, you know, the New England study said, oh, we can't do grains, we can't do poultry. Well, if you expand that boundary to the Northeast, like the USDA Northeast Air region, well, now you have the Delmarva Peninsula. There's a lot of grain. That's our source where most of our poultry comes from. So. These, some of these things become artifacts just depending on how you frame them. So is it good or bad that stuff has to come, whatever that is, six hours by truck to get here? Is it, should we try and build a poultry industry in a place that doesn't grow grain as well? You know, that's, those are the kinds of things I think people need to think through. Oh, maybe that's not so bad versus if the chicken's coming from, you know, Mexico, hmm, that probably doesn't make sense. Yeah, I mean, the one number you gave, the pragmatic number was 60 a uh, potential for 60% of regional food production in terms of supporting the, the people in the region. What would that be if you just looked at Vermont? I'm just going to see if I can find that booklet. Hold on. Um, I think it's 50 by 50. Vermont, so 60 by 60, 50 by 50 Vermont. I just can't find it right now. but um. It's New England, I think it's New England Food Solutions. So Brian Donahue of Brandeis was the lead author on that study. Okay. And he's a food historian. It's really interesting. So one thing he did was go back and look, well, what did we grow historically? Wow, it turns out we grew a lot more of our food than we do now. We had a lot more acreage. And so that informs you right away. There's a whole slew of things that are proven to be doable. And then another you know, interesting thing, it depends on what diet you assume for the population. So is it the standard USDA diet or is it a lower protein diet or you know that that also affects what percent you could you could do. Um, and so I just like that it's a very data oriented assessment where we've been, what we eat, what we could what we could do and then you know how much land we'll need. So one striking conclusion of that is we'd have to clear a lot of land to get back to the acreage we need to, to make that amount of food. And most of that is probably like southern New Hampshire, southern Maine, because southern New England is urbanized and expensive and built up. Um, they had done a study in earlier years about the forest. So one thing, if you want to leave an intact forest, and way northern New England is the place to do that. It still mostly exists and is not so suited for agriculture. So that's a really interesting land use and policy question. All right, if we want to grow more of our food, get to that number, and here are the places where most of the increase would come from. There's still plenty of little nooks and crannies in Vermont and everywhere to ramp up, but to, I forget the number. It's thousands and thousands of acres more we would need. Um, like, that's just a reality check. Okay, <laughs> how do you make that happen to, to get that land back into, back into ag? Um, so I just like it's not pie in the sky. They're like really clear issues and specific um, challenges to address to, to to produce more of our food. Anyone else? How about the Saskatoon barriers? Do you have anyone working with that here in Vermont? Um, there are lots of niche berry things happening. There's probably a few of that. The bigger one is. Um, 
which is still very tiny. There's a lot of interest in Aronia. Um, I don't know, maybe half a dozen farms doing some of that. And, and SARE funded a great research project um, at the University of Connecticut, Mark Brandt, who had a grad student who basically nobody knew about the genetics of Aronia. They're, it's a native species, but there were, you know, polyploid types which had multiple genes in, um, in the cells uh, in Russia. And anyway, long story short, he laid the groundwork. If you actually wanted to have a breeding program to create erroneous varieties that would have what people want, the not super astringent, able to make the juices with the health benefits that would be desirable, um, he did the kind of foundational research that's necessary. And so that's what I love is this partnership of, you know, that's the kind of thing farmers aren't going to do. They're not geneticists. They're not, so he can get that information and Sarah requires those kind of researchers to work with farmers. So we had a small number, I think five farmers actually doing trials and they held field days. But, you know, some things we have established industries and we're trying to accomplish certain things. And then we have these other things that are in their infancy and you don't know if they're going to pan out or not, but you do need the partnership of research to address those key um, obstacles. Is that erroneous that you're talking about black currants? No, it's, uh, but we have people doing currants right. too, and I, that's... I don't um, know that isn't it called plant? chokeberry as well? Yes, it's chokeberry. Oh, chokeberry. Okay. Which I know about that choke cherries. Right, I know it. Alrighty, I think we're going to have to wrap it up, but uh, we really appreciate the time and the information. It's awesome. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so right. much. Thank you. Thank you.